Good afternoon, guys. I hope we are all sparkly. We're going to do a video on the differences between testosterone sipinate and testosterone and anthate. Why? Because you guys have asked me to do one. I've done a blog, but you're clearly too lazy to read that. So here we are, sat here on a Saturday afternoon, doing a video log, just waiting for the rugby to come on. England, Wales, we better smash the Welsh. Um, so, enanthate versus sipinate. As you guys know, I am a massive proponent of daily subcutaneous testosterone injections to mimic natural physiology. Can you use both of these substances, either of these substances? And of course, yes. The answer is yes. They are practically identical when it comes to half-life. The chemical structure, how they bond, are very different. But the half-lives are practically the same. Sipinate has another carbon atom, makes it a bit longer. But if you want to change from sipinate to enanthate or enanthate to sipinate, there is no need to adjust your dose or your injection frequency. Now that's actually not 100% true when it comes to uh, subcutaneous injections versus intramuscular. Intramuscular, yeah, 100% same. But sub -Q's very slightly different. And we'll get onto that in a minute. It's to do with the concentration. So enanthate, 250 milligrams in a mil, sipinate 125 milligrams in a mil. Not only does that mean that you can more accurately dose sipinate, it actually means the absorption is slightly different in the subcutaneous tissue versus the intramuscular tissue. So intramuscular route, yep, same. Doesn't matter about the concentration, but sub-Q it does. Because what you're doing is you're injecting into the adipose tissue and that has to be dispersed into the capillaries and lymphatic system and then go to the liver to be cleaved. So the concentration actually does have an effect. So we have found when changing guys from enanthate to sipionate via the subcutaneous route, their total testosterone has risen a little bit. And conversely, if you change from sipionate to enanthate, and you fortunately get the NHS to prescribe you the enanthate, then sometimes we have to increase the dose of the enanthate or switch to shallow intramuscular injections to achieve the same total testosterone level. So concentration actually is important. Dosing and absorption. What else? Uh, the carrier oil. The carrier oil in enanthate is sesame oil, which is quite viscous. The carrier oil in sipionate is olive oil. I've already made a bad joke about it being heart healthy, so I won't make it again. But it's uh, far more fluid, which means, again, when we're injecting into the subcutaneous tissue, it can be dispersed far more effectively. Is it only to do with actually achieving stable levels? No, it's actually also to do with uh, the irritation it can potentially cause in the subcutaneous tissue. There was a proportion, a definitely statistically significant proportion of guys who were complaining of lumps when they were injecting enanthate compared to injecting sipionate. And then obviously that can potentially cause irritation irritation then can cause uh, bacteria to get in and then you can have trouble with cellulitis stroke abscess so it was a small proportion but it was a statistically significant proportion of guys what else uh, the preservative so the preservative in enanthate is chlorobutanol it's known to be a skin irritant above concentration of 0.5. And the concentration of chlorobutanol in enanthate is 5%. So you're pretty much guaranteed a small degree of irritation. 
Is it problematic in the majority of people? No. But again, in a small proportion of guys, it can be quite problematic. In no way, shape or form as bad as um, Sustanon with its massively high benzoyl alcohol content, which should never be injected subcutaneously. In Anthate, it has a safety profile. There's been lots of research behind uh, using Enanthate subcutaneously, but through clinical experience and obviously having an understanding of its components and constituents, um, it isn't gold standard. Uh, not only can you uh, create irritation, discomfort, you can also cause uh, a decrease in the absorption so hence you need a higher dose. So when it boils down to it, intramuscularly, there really is no difference between testosterone enanthate and testosterone sipinate. But when it comes to injecting via this subcutaneous route, there is a difference because of the concentration, the carry it all, and the preservative. So the beauty about private practice is I can offer my guys the service and care that I believe is gold standard. And as you guys know, my first choice is testosterone sipinate. Second choice, testosterone and anthate. Third choice, microdosing nibido. Fourth choice, the gel, fifth choice, bog standard. Uh, sixth choice, I don't even use, I don't, I don't use prop. I think it's a stupid compound um, for the reasons discussed in the previous video. So anybody advocating prop as a suitable choice for TRT clearly doesn't know their arse from their elbow. Um, so there you go. Again, the premise behind TRT is avoiding peaks and troughs, stable levels. Doesn't matter when it is towards your injection day, you want to have stable levels 24-7 because hormones follow a stable level. I don't know what I'm talking about now. I wanted to come up with a nice end, but now I'm just rambling. So I'm just going to say... Peace out.